So I've been writing JavaScript for a very long time, and I have always kind of just accepted the fact that type of null is object. And a lot of people like to poke fun at JavaScript because of all these little quirks. And once you've written enough JavaScript, you get used to things like this, and maybe you don't give it a second of thought. But today, I decided to figure out why. Why does this equal object? Is there a specific reason for this? Have they ever tried to fix it? And that led me down a nice long rabbit hole. So let's dive in. So first, I headed over to MDN to look up the type of operator, and this actually has a table that describes all of the various types that you can pass into it and the corresponding strings that you're going to get back. And lo and behold, you see there, if we pass in null, it gives us back object. And so you can see here, it says in the first implementation of JavaScript, JavaScript values were represented as a type tag and a value. The type tag for objects was zero. Null was represented as the null pointer, which is also zero. And consequently, null had zero as a type tag. Hence, the type of return value was object. And this actually comes from a blog post written by Dr. Axel Rauschmeier. This post was from 2013 called The History of type of null, and he dives into it. He talks about uh, why this is the case and talks about this type tag thing that was mentioned on MDN, and then also shows the actual source code for the original implementation of the type of operator inside of JavaScript. And so this is C code from the original source code for the original implementation of this. And he actually found this by posting on Twitter. So back when he was researching this blog post, uh, he actually posted about it, and then Evil Pies responded with the source from the classic version of Mozilla, which was Netscape. And so I thought, great, we can dive in, we can actually look at the original source code. However, it currently is throwing a not found error. And so of course I went back, I grabbed that original URL, I plugged it into the Wayback Machine. It also <laughs> returns a 404 not found. I did some more digging and eventually I found the C file on the web archive, but this is not the header file. So the link originally was to a .h file. So if you're not familiar with C, header files are kind of like descriptions of what's going to be implemented. And then your C file is your actual implementation. So we can see here is the original type of function right there. But this has a lot of references to things that are not defined in this file file. They're actually defined in the header file. So I was like, all right, we need to find this header file. And this led me down a pretty interesting history of Netscape and how it was originally open source. So why are we even able to see this source code for Netscape? Well, back in January of 1998, Netscape announced that by the end of the first quarter of 1998, they were going to release the source code for Netscape Communicator version 5.0. And so this is the actual source code that we're looking at. Now, here we're potentially looking at a slightly later version of the code because we are looking at a snapshot that was taken on 2020, and this code has been iterated on since it was originally released. Uh, so yeah, it was open source back in 1998, and I wanted to find like the original, original commit, and I was able to do that. So there's this repo here called the Mozilla CVS history. If you're not familiar with CVS, it is concurrent versions system. So it's this is a version control system. These days, we pretty much use Git for everything, but CVS was an earlier version of version control that was used for the Netscape source code. And I actually went back in time and found the commit from 27 years ago that was called Free the Lizard. And I was actually able to, to find the source code and kind of dig into it. And so if you head into the JS directory and then the source directory, here is all of the source codes from 27 years ago. And specifically the files that we're looking for are jsapi.c and jsapi.h. And once you start digging into the code, you can see here, we actually have these type tags that they were referencing in that blog post. So you have the type tag for objects, ints, doubles, strings, and booleans. And then each one of these has a specific value. So objects are zero, ints are one, doubles are two, strings are four, and booleans are six. And so essentially the way that JavaScript was implemented, so once your code was compiled and running inside of the JavaScript engine, every value was stored as as a long. So if you look at C data types, a long is a signed integer type with a minimum value of this and a maximum value of this. And so essentially every running JavaScript program, any values defined, whether they're objects or strings or, or numbers, they're all actually at the end of the day getting stored inside of a long. And to figure that out actually took a lot of digging. So in C, there's a thing called a type def, which actually allows you to define custom types, but there's tons of indirection. And so I kind of just have some notes here of how I found it. And so when you're looking in this header file, you see this JS value everywhere. And so this is the type that's used to correspond to a value in your JavaScript program, but this isn't a native C type. And so I dug through the source code and kind of like traced it backwards. And so JSVal is actually defined from PR word, which is actually defined from PR word underscore T, which comes from NSPR pub, which is also in that source code repo. Anybody that knows more about C or knows more about the history of this can, uh, can let me know in the comments what these specifically are. But within that, there's another header file that defines PR word. And then finally, if you trace that back, 
back, PR word is defined as long. So anywhere in the source code, whenever you see JSVal, really we're looking at long values. And you can see here that a long is 32 bits. So that means when your program is running, any variables that are of this type long or of type JS value are going to take up 32 bits. So from there, we can actually start to understand what these tags are used for. And so I've drawn up a little table here where you can see the type on the left and then their tags on the right. And so we're representing this as 32 bits. And so when we say 32 bits, you can just think of it as a series of 32 zeros or ones. And so in the case of int, we have a tag of one and then 31 bits to the left that are used to store the actual value. And so this is the one special case in all of our types. Whenever we're dealing with ints, the tag length is only one bit, but for all of our other types, the tag length is three bits. And so here we can see the object has a tag of zero. And so when we come across a value with three zeros on the tag, we know we're dealing with an object. And then a double has a tag of two. And so when we come across a value that has a tag of zero, one, zero, which is two in binary, we know we're dealing with a double. String has a value of four. So when we come across a value with a tag of one, zero, zero, which is four in binary, we know we're dealing with a string. And then when we come across a value of six, which is one, one, zero in binary, we know that we're dealing with a Boolean. And so essentially the tag is those last three bits. And then anything to the left is going to have the actual value of whatever we're trying to store here. And so now that we have an idea of how the values are stored, we can take a look at how null is stored and defined. And so when we look at the codes, you can see they actually have this macro defined here. It's called JS value underscore null. This actually stores the literal value of null. And you can see this then calls out to another macro called object to JS value and passes in the value zero. And then object to JS value just casts that value to a JS value. So we already learned that a JS value is a long and the object that they passed in here was zero. So literally the value stored for JS value null is a long with the value of zero. And so now you can kind of start to see what might happen here. So because null is just zero, it's going to have a tag of zero, right? Because a, a 32 bit long with a value of zero is literally just going to have 32 zeros. But if we have code that specifically is looking at that tag there, it's going to think that this is an object. And so now with, with that knowledge, we can kind of dig into the code and, and specifically look at the type of value function. And so this is a, a pretty straightforward function. It takes in a JS val, which of course is going to be a long, and then runs several of these various macros to determine if it is that specific type. And so there's a macro here for JS value is void. And in this case, JS value void has a value inside of it that is this. Now we talk about JavaScript being convoluted. Look at all this indirection. There's so many defines that we have to go to. But ultimately, if you follow all of these macros and then resolve the actual value, JS value void is equal to negative two to the 31st power minus one. Um, basically, we I did the maths here. So <laughs> this resolves to this, which resolves to this, this, this. And then you have some bitwise operators. And eventually you get this number here, which is actually the uh, smallest possible 32 bit value. Regardless, that's what's inside of JS value void. And so when this runs, it basically compares the value. If that value is equal to negative two to the 31st power minus one, then the type is void. And you can see here, JS type void is just from this enum. So this enum has all of the possible types, undefined object, function, string, number, and Boolean. And as you can see, there is no type null inside of there. Now from there, all of these other comparators are really looking at that tag value on the end of the value. So if you look at JS value is object, there's a macro here that's going to grab the tag, which is those last few bits from the specific value to see if it is that specific tag. So all of our tags are here. And then that macro is going to pull the tag off of the number. And so if you had a real object where all of this was not zeros, it was like actual values, then we'd pull off the tag, see that the tag was zero, and then know that this part here could be represented as an object. And so that's what this JS val tag macro is doing. It's essentially doing all of the bit shifting to grab those last three bits so it can determine the tag of the specific number. Okay, so basically, if the tag is zero, then we know that it's an object, but it's also possible that it's a function. So we have some extra code here. Now, JSVal is number checks to see if it's an integer or a double, because if you remember from the tags, we have double and we have int. We don't actually have number. And so all this does is gets the tag as if it were an integer, gets the tag as if it were a double. And if either of those is true, then it is a number. Then for string, all we have to do is pull off the tag, compare it to our tag value, and then same thing for Boolean. So we've made it. <laughs> we've walked through the code. And if you've been following, you can see that there is literally no check for null here. And so the code that I've been showing you, I've actually extracted out so that I could get it to run. Now I'm not compiling the entire Netscape browser. I just have some C code here that does specifically this type stuff. And so in this example program, I have a value here, which is a JS val, and I'm storing JS value null inside of it. And then we're calling our type of function, which gives us back a JS type. And enums inside of C are number based. So each one of these is a number. So zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And so from there, we can pass that into another function called 
called get type name, which specifically takes that number and then returns the index in this list of types. And then here I'm just printing it out. Now, the other thing I'm doing here is if that value is equal to null, and so in C, null is actually a macro that is void star of zero. But if our specific value is equal to that, we're also going to print out that it points to null. And so if we compile and run this program, you can see that the type of null gets detected as an object, but it actually does point to null. And if we want to try this out with other types, we could try like a JS value for Boolean. And so this is essentially a JS value that only has the tag for Boolean. And so this code doesn't make that much sense. But ultimately, because it has the tag of a Boolean, whenever we run the code, it's going to give us that type of Boolean and it doesn't point to null. And we could pass in any of these other types. So JS value of like a double should give us back number. It does. And of course, we could pass in the tag for string and it gives us back string. So ultimately, there's just a bug in this code, right? Literally, all we need is probably one more if statement that checks to see, is it null? And then if that's the case, then maybe type of a value can actually return the string null. So let me just update the code to do that. Now, one of the most interesting things about this is they actually did have a macro defined called JS val is null. This exists in the code, but they're just not using it. But you can see it compares that value with JS value null, which actually has that null pointer inside of it. But in this case, we can actually use it. Now, we will need to add another type. So if we head back up to our enum, we can add a type here called null. And then in our array, we just need to add null on the end here. And that should do it. Now, our typo function is going to check for null first. And if it is null, it's just going to return the type as null. So let's actually pass in null here run the codes, and look at that. We fixed JavaScript, and now it actually has a type of that returns null. So that's it, right? We just submit a PR to Mr. JavaScript, and everything's fixed? Well, not exactly. So there's actually a long history of uh, people trying to fix this, and there's a lot of discussion that happened around it. And essentially, this discussion started around ECMAScript Harmony. So back in 2008, it was announced that TC39 was actually going to start working on this thing called Harmony, because back then, there was a lot of ideas about how JavaScript could evolve, and a lot of discussions around what should change or what what shouldn't change. And the idea was to kind of harmonize around all of these ideas and push forward on some common ground that's actually described in this note here from Brandon Ike back in 2008. And what's interesting about this is ECMAScript 4 was never released. So you've probably heard of ES3, and then you've probably heard of ES5. And after that, we got ECMAScript 6 or ES2015, but there never was a version 4. And so there was a lot of discussion. And, and essentially, we were talking about adding classes in the module system and all this modern stuff that we have in JavaScript, even back in 2008. Uh, but eventually that was abandoned. And then in 2009, they did release the fifth version of the ECMAScript standard that added some newer stuff, but it wasn't as big a leap as was described here. And the reason I'm even bringing this up is because when they were having this discussion around new features and how they should make the language better, the discussion of fixing the type of operator came up. And they mentioned that in Harmony, there potentially could be an opt-in, if you could think of it almost like strict mode, where if you opt into this, then type of null would return the strict null. And then if you weren't using the Harmony version, then it would return object as it was. And there's a lot of discussion around this. There's a lot of rationale. This is actually super interesting to read because you see all these people like Brandon Icke and Douglas Crockford and Alan Wurstbrock all talking about, well, should we add this? Shouldn't we add this? And ultimately, they ended up not adding it. So you can see here that this proposal was rejected and it was implemented in V8, but it turned out that it broke a lot of existing sites. In the spirit of one JavaScript, this is not feasible. And so you might not have even heard the term one JavaScript before. And so this led me down another rabbit hole. But essentially, all of the discussions around Harmony and like making the JavaScript language better culminated in ES6 or ES2015. And so this is the modern features of ECMAScript, of, of JavaScript that we know and love. But one of the things you may not realize is their whole goal here was to maintain backwards compatibility. And so there's actually another blog post from Axel back in 2014 called One JavaScript, Avoiding Versioning in ECMAScript. And there was a long drawn out process and discussion around, well, should should ECMAScript be versioned? Like, should you be able to opt into a version of JavaScript where type of works in a different way than it does in other versions of JavaScript? And there's a lot of discussion around it, but ultimately they decided against it. And one of the examples that Axel has here in this blog post is in the Python world, there was a jump from Python 2 to Python 3. And some of the changes in Python 3 were, were backwards incompatible, right? There's some Python 3 programs that you cannot run through a Python 2 interpreter. And there was potential for JavaScript to go down that path. But ultimately they decided against it in the term that they coined was one JavaScript. And one of their goals is essentially making ECMAScript 6 completely backwards compatible. And so this is one of the major reasons there are a lot of quirks in the language that still exist to this day. Essentially, some very smart people went back and forth on this and, and talked about, well, should we introduce breaking changes? Should we not? And ultimately landed on this idea of backwards compatibility. 
And ultimately, I think this was a great decision. So uh, here Axel is saying, programmers profit immediately from one JavaScript because it makes it easier to get started with ECMAScript 6. Imagine having a fractured web where like some websites are using the certain versions of JavaScript and some aren't. I think it was a really good decision. And this is why type of null returns object and probably will never return the string null. And to close this off, there's actually a post from Adam Argyle yesterday that said, uh, Legos never change or update their shapes. Everything from day one still works with stuff in 2024. So nice. Nice. Sound familiar? Yeah, the web is like that too. And there's a lot of discussion in the comments, but I think ultimately Adam is talking about like web standards like ECMAScript and CSS and HTML and this idea that you can take some of the code that was written 20, 30 years ago and it will still run in the latest engines that have all these nice features but still are completely backwards compatible. So that's the story of Type of Null. Hopefully you enjoyed this trip down memory lane and uh, this dive into some source codes. And let me know what you think. Do you think we might get to a point where we'll have a breaking version of JavaScript or maybe type of will return something like no? Let me know down in the comments. That's it for this one. Keep on coding. I'll see you in the next one.